When I was in seminary up at uh, Princeton, I was serving as an intern for a church right nearby at Kingston. And every year they had one of those living nativity scenes that people could come and drive through. And about every 20 minutes, the production would happen in the grassy area next to the church. And we piped in uh, music from speakers inside the church with songs and voiceover reading the scripture. And me being the intern got roped into playing one of the parts. And so I was Joseph. Now Joseph is not a bad part to play in one of these things because pretty much you don't have to do anything. My job was there was a donkey. Its name was Clive. And my job was to take the donkey and walk from about here over to where Randy is with Mary next to me and stand there with the donkey under this makeshift stable thing. That was my role. It was pretty easy. All I had to do was walk with the donkey. And he was a good donkey. I liked that donkey. I didn't have lines, I didn't have to do anything complicated, just walk with a donkey. That's typically Joseph, an extra. It's the easiest role in the pageant, the afterthought. When it comes to picking parts at the Christmas play, you want to pick Joseph so you don't get stuck with an angel who has to do a whole bunch of announcing to people, or a shepherd that has to bathe sheep like we saw last week. For those who weren't here, the children's play, uh, you can still watch it on DVD. You know, we don't want one of those roles. We have to have lots and lots of lines and lots of complications. Joseph is safe and easy. At least so we think. You know, Matthew's story focuses on Joseph a lot more than Mary. But when we tend to do Christmas patches and think of the Christmas story, we tend to think a whole lot more about Luke, which focuses a lot more on Mary. Luke, in general, focuses more on women in his gospel than any of the others. Matthew focuses a lot more on Joseph. In Matthew's genealogy in chapter 1, he goes through the list of people from Abraham down to David, all the way to Joseph and Mary, the parents of Jesus. Now that can be kind of confusing. Does that mean that Joseph is the father of Jesus? Because we're looking at the line of David. Jesus is the son of David. That means Jesus is Joseph's son, right? Well, no. Yes. No. It's complicated. Family matters are often complicated, especially at Christmas. Family matters can often get complicated. You see, Joseph was engaged to a woman named Mary. Was she 13? Was she 30? We don't know. But they were engaged. Now, engagement back then was a legal thing. You didn't just hop down on your knee at the IHOP or some fancy restaurant or the drive through on a whim. Don't get engaged in IHOP. Just, that's a bad idea. <laughs> in case anybody's thinking about it, don't. But engagement was a serious business. It could only be broken by going to court. None of these quick engagements and broken engagements you can read about while you're waiting in line at the grocery store. Didn't happen that way back then. Joseph was engaged. He may have been engaged for years. Engagements often lasted a long time. The two families came together, signed the papers, and when the couple became of age or had the dowry or built the house, then they married. Joseph is engaged to Mary, but he discovers that she is pregnant. Now what's he going to do? Joseph's fiance is pregnant. It would appear she broke the contract. Now what should Joseph do? Matthew tells us Joseph was a good man. A righteous man, a man who wants to do the right thing, that's great and all, but how do you know what the right thing is? What is the right thing to do here? Here is a carpenter living in a community engaged to a woman named Mary, and it is evident she is pregnant. What is Joseph to do? What is the right thing to do? Nowadays, when you have a big problem, what you do is you post it on Facebook. And many friends and people you heard of once but confirmed as friends will comment on your problem and they'll tell you what to do. It's just a 21st century coffee shop where you go in, you get a straw poll opinion over the others at the counter. It's in our nature to ask around and say, well, what do you think I should do? And people love to give their opinions. You'll find that people love to give their opinions of what you should do even when you don't even ask them. Anybody ever found that? People say, you know what, I think you ought to do this. It happens. Well, what's the right thing to do? Well, Joseph gives his mom a call. They both have AT&T service, so it's free minutes to talk. 
And, she, and he asked, well, what should I do? And well, his mom just wants to look out for her baby boy, doesn't want him disgraced, and thinks justice here is very important. She broke the contract and broke her boy's heart, so Joseph should get rid of her and expose her for what she is. It's only right. She knew the rules going into the game. She got pregnant, and now her son has to pay? Well, that's not right. The right thing to do is to get rid of Mary quickly and fast. Joseph's friend Richard is more concerned about Joseph's future. He makes the point that it might be hard to be a reputable businessman in this small city with a wife that starts off like this. You know, word gets around Joseph. People don't like to associate. People will talk. If you get rid of her now, there might be some words for a while that people will soon forget. But if you don't act now, it'll get worse for you and for her. The best thing to do is just cut your losses now. Joseph, don't be self-destructive about this. She brought it on herself. You know, help those that help themselves. She didn't help herself in this situation, so you better get rid of her. Is that the right thing? Justice? We say that's right. Protect your future? Isn't that right? Think pragmatically. Don't be self-destructive about it. God helps those that help themselves. We say that, don't we? Is that the right thing to do? Joseph also has some very religious friends, some who just finished synagogue school up in Princeton and are now filled with scriptural knowledge and self-righteousness about that knowledge. And you know what they say? They say... Just do what the Bible says, Joseph. You can never go wrong when you just follow God's word. What about that for an answer? I've heard that before. Have you? Just do what the Bible says. Just like that. Simple and easy. Just do what the Bible says. Well, I will tell you what the Bible says, and then we can just call it quits, because then it's over, because we did what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 22, straight from the Pentateuch. According to the good book... She used to be taken out and stoned to death in front of the people. Well, that's settled then. We did what the Bible says, and we stoned her. All done. That's what the Bible says to do. Take her out and stone her. One of my favorite preachers, a guy named Fred Craddock, he's a Southern Disciples of Christ minister. He's like 95 now. He's feisty. He said this. He said, I get sick and tired of people always thumping the Bible as though you can just open it up and turn to a passage that clears everything up. You can quote the Bible before killing a person to justify the killing. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, the Bible says. Do you know what the Bible says? If a man finds something displeasing in his wife, anything, something, let him give her a divorce and send her out of the house. It's in the book. Do you know what the Bible says? That the women keep their heads covered and their mouths shut. Do you want me to find it for you? It's in there. I run into so many people who carry around a 43-pound Bible and say, just do what the book says. Craddock gets a little fired up there because he's seen it. He's been around 95 years. He knows the pain. He knows Joseph's pain. The religious tell him to just look to the good book and then those same people can wash their hands of the consequences and the pain because, well, they pointed him to God. But you and I know the Bible is not that simple. If it were that simple, we ought to grab a bunch of these stones that are out there and come in here and we've been out of all this congregation for all sorts of transgressions from divorce to planting crops side by side to sewing on a patch on your clothing. It's not the same material. The good news is we have a whole lot of stones on our property. The bad news is I don't think they'd be able to find any one of us worthy enough to throw them at ourselves. We'd have to hit ourselves with them. But there's another good news thing. I bet we can find some people right here in Peoria that go to some churches that think they've got it all figured out. That would be more than willing to come in here and pick up the stones and throw them at us because, well, they've read the Bible, they know right well what it says, and they've lived it all right. I guarantee you. There are people who say, well, this is what it says. If you don't do it, I'll, I'll pick up a stone and throw it at you. Is that the right thing to do? Because we got some stones out there. See, now Joseph here. This is the exciting part. Joseph, forgotten, easy, simple, amazing Joseph, rises to a point that is absolutely remarkable for his day and time. 
Honestly, it's remarkable for our day.